Good morning. Uh, today, the uh, Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming will have a briefing from the Ambassador of the European Commission to the United States regarding the EU's progress toward the Copenhagen negotiations, and then we will have a hearing to learn about our country's progress. Despite the chill in the air today, global temperatures remain high. 2008 was tied for the eighth warmest year on record. The evidence of shrinking ice caps and increasingly violent storms remind us of the danger and challenges we face due to climate change. The debate is no longer about whether humans are causing global warming, but what we are prepared to do about it. Now that the United States has a president committed to action, Congress is poised to help resolve it. Last Congress made progress with the passage of the 2007 Energy Bill which by raising fuel economy and appliance efficiency standards will reduce global warming pollution in the future. Now the task confronting us is how to construct policies that meet the scientific need and the political will. To accomplish this, we will build and improve upon the good work from the 110th Congress. During this economic crisis, we must find a way to lay a new foundation for growth, as President Obama said in his inaugural address. That is our challenge, to embrace the opportunity to create sustainable jobs and a resilient economy, to reduce our dependence on oil, and to prevent human misery. But the United States cannot solve this problem alone. The only prospect for success exists if the global community engages in a joint effort. This is the challenge the international community accepted in Bali in 2007. At that meeting, Delegates from almost 200 countries met to discuss international climate protection. They decided on a path of negotiations leading to a comprehensive future climate regime to be adopted in 2009 in Copenhagen. The select committee one year ago heard testimony about the progress made at the Bali meeting. Today we are at the halfway point on the road to Copenhagen. This hearing will examine what progress has been made in answering the four main questions posed by the Bali Roadmap. How to fulfill the needed greenhouse gas reductions outlined by science. How to adapt to impacts we can no longer avoid. How to answer the need for technology cooperation. And how to support poor countries as they struggle to cope with the realities of climate change. It is time to take stock and to plan ahead. There are encouraging signs all across the globe. Mexico, South Africa, the EU, and others have made significant domestic commitments. China's recent five-year plan makes energy efficiency, renewables, and carbon re uh, reduction a priority. Carbon markets are being implemented all across the world. The next step from Bali was Poznan, Poland, in December. Almost 4,000 government officials met to negotiate the next step on the path to Copenhagen. Today, we will examine the concrete results of the conference, the progress of the international community on the Bali Agreement, and if that progress is enough to guide us out of the climate crisis. There are only 305 days left until the final negotiations in Copenhagen. 305 days from today, the United States and the world will have to reach an agreement that reduces global warming pollution and facilitates cooperation on adapting to unavoidable climate impacts, developing and deploying low carbon te uh, technology, and financing aid to developing countries. The road to Copenhagen will require the determination of heads of state and the hard work of negotiators, policymakers, scientists, and economists alike. It will not be easy but there is no alternative to a global solution. We must find a way to protect the planet while ensuring prosperity for those on it. That concludes the opening statement of the chair. We now turn to recognize the ranking minority member, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, I thank the chair. Global warming is a universal challenge. The logic supporting a global treaty is therefore obvious, but a global agreement without global commitments is not a solution. 
With the United Nations self-imposed deadline to replace the Kyoto Protocol approaching, we can't allow expedience to dictate a costly and ineffective response. <clears throat> Opposition to Kyoto was bipartisan. In 1997, the Senate voted 95 to nothing to pass the Bird hagel Resolution, stating that the United States should not be a signatory to a treaty that does not include binding targets for developing nations or that would result in serious harm to the economy. Because Kyoto failed on both counts, President Clinton never submitted the treaty to the Senate for ratification. Kyoto's principal failure was its lack of inclusiveness. By only requiring commitments from developed countries, Kyoto does not place restrictions on a majority of countries, including three of the world's five largest emitters, China, India, and Brazil. A treaty cannot reduce emissions without their participation. Even Al Gore, Al Gore conceded that binding commitments from developing countries are essential. But I was the only member of the House to attend the UN climate conference in Poznan last December, and negotiations are not headed in that direction. I met with delegations from both China and India, and I asked, point blank, will you agree to mandatory emissions cuts? Both countries said no. The emissions in the developing world are rising so rapidly that reductions from developed countries will be entirely offset by countries without binding commitments. The Battelle Memorial Institute recently calculated that, based on business as usual projections, developing countries will produce more emissions than developed countries within the next 10 years. And there is a graphic over there uh, that demonstrates that fact. A recent article in Foreign Affairs magazine quantified China's growth. By 2050, China is expected to have more cars than the United States. China's grand-scale urbanization plan will aggravate matters. China's leaders plan to relocate 400 million people to newly developed urban centers between 2000 and 2030. In the process, they will erect half of all the buildings expected to be constructed in the world during that period. That is a troubling prospect considering the Chinese buildings are not energy efficient. In fact, they are roughly two and a half times less so than those in Germany. Rather than accept mandatory limits or increase its efficiency, China and other developing countries hope to sell offsets to the, developing, the developed world. Accepting foreign investment is hardly a sacrifice comparable to binding limits on emissions. But beyond the unfairness, there's no way to guarantee that the offsets will actually happen. The theory is sound. Instead of limiting emissions where they're the most costly, companies can make the same cuts for less money abroad. The problems, however, are twofold. First, the money should be invested in our, it should be invested in our own economy as sent to China. And second, many of the offsets won't happen. A recent project demonstration demonstrates the, project of the problem. Germany recently agreed to purchase offset credits from Chinese developers to build a new dam. The UN approved more than 16 million credits for the project. This legitimizes 16 million tons of emissions in Germany and generates tens of millions of dollars of revenue for China. The problem beyond the massive transfer of wealth is that developers began constructing the dam two years before applying for the credits. According to the British Times Online, one UN official estimated that 20 percent of the carbon credits failed to result in actual reductions. Karen Harbert, the president and CEO of the Institute for 21st Century Energy, will testify that the 2007 UN negotiations in Bali, Indonesia, produced positive steps towards a new treaty. In Bali, developing countries agreed to actions that were measurable, reportable, and verifiable. This fits with the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities that I support and that is fundamental in these negotiations. An agreement to handicap a handful of economies won't change economic realities. Consumers will still buy goods. The manufacture of these goods will result in the same emissions. And America will simply outsource more emissions and more jobs. Every country has the right and every government has the obligation to pull its citizens from poverty and advance their way of life. The current global downturn starkly demonstrates that wealth isn't a fixed pie. It can increase and decrease in absolute terms, and American prosperity doesn't come at the expense of the world. 
the entire economic world can grow. But all that growth must be subject to the same limitations. We cannot self-impose costs while foreign markets grow freely. The result is too predictable. A long-term contraction of the U.S. economy coupled with the continued explosion of global markets. In the face of intense pressure to find a solution, we can't adopt a costly one that won't work. And I thank the Chair. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you. I'd like to make uh, three points. Uh, first, I want to ask, answer the question why we're here when we have uh, such an economic a meltdown underway while we're talking about global warming. And I want to suggest there's two reasons for it. Number one, uh, the Arctic, as it melted this summer, did not pay any attention to the Dow Jones average. Uh, the Pacific did not pay any attention to the Standard & Poor's as it became 30 percent more acidic in the last 50 years. Mother Nature does not wait for us. We have a, a it's a necessity of, of acting now. And secondly, uh, anyone who looked around, the best opportunities for economic growth in this country are associated with beating global warming. We know there's a world out there that's going to want these technologies, and we believe, and we took a first step with our economic recovery package to develop these technologies. This is an economic recovery mission that we are on, as well as a global environmental one. Second point as to why we should act while China has not entered into an agreement yet with us. Let me suggest that I believe uh, the road ahead, the most single most important thing we can do is for the United States to regain its moral authority to lead the world. Uh, we haven't, we're not in a real strong position to lead right now because we haven't acted. And I would suggest that we need to act domestically before Copenhagen so that we have moral authority to lead the world into an international agreement. And I believe it is in our American destiny to do this. And what we did uh, last week in adopting our economic recovery plan, which has about $88 billion of investment in these new technologies, we are on our way to restoring our moral authority to lead the world. The, the moral of the story is you can't blame everything on China when you haven't done anything at home. And I wish we'd spend more time figuring out how we're going to have a domestic response to this and a little less time blaming all the problems of the world on China when we're the ones who have a, five, a three to five times more CO2 output per capita than the Chinese. A third uh, point, just real quickly, I met with the Deputy Minister of Environment for Czechoslovakia yesterday. He had some very interesting ideas about what we should ask the Chinas of India of the world. I believe there are many things we can obtain by agreement with the developing world, uh, but we need to regain our moral authority first. Thank you. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I, I appreciate what my friend, the ranking member from Wisconsin, uh, outlined. There are real considerations we need to take into account to be able to do this right. Uh, but while uh, Germany may be uh, two and a half times more energy efficient than China, uh, the United States doesn't look all that good in comparison with Germany itself, uh, despite uh, our uh, advanced economy and having talked about this for some time. I do feel very strongly that um, Mr. Inslee's point about this being the path for the new economy, for one that's sustainable and has economic opportunity, is uh, spot on. Uh, I think the, with benefit of this hearing and the work, Mr. Chairman, you're doing with the Select Committee, we can uh, refine proposals to make sure that we don't outsource pollution and jobs. Uh, there's no reason we can't refine our own trade and environmental policies to make sure that there is, for example, a carbon tariff to avoid that. These are things that are within our capacity. Now that the United States has ended uh, an eight-year hiatus where it's not part of uh, the global process uh, working in tandem, uh, that we have a president that is committed to our international cooperation and our international leadership. Uh, I look forward to uh, hearing from the witnesses and devising uh, uh, legislation and ideas that are based on the experience around the world, good and bad, so that we can meet this uh, global climate challenge. Thank you.
Great. I thank the gentleman. Uh, time has expired for opening statements. Uh, and we will now begin with a briefing from His Excellency uh, John Bruton, who is the ambassador of the European Commission to the United States. Uh, as a reminder, we are not receiving testimony from a witness, but a briefing by a foreign dignitary. Uh, the Select Committee is honored to hear from Ambassador Bruton. Uh, before accepting his current position, Ambassador Bruton was the Prime Minister, the Taoiseach of Ireland, where he helped to transform the economy and enhance the peace process. Your Excellency, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Whenever you are comfortable, um, we would invite you to begin your testimony. Could, is your microphone on? Sorry. Okay, please. Um, sorry, sir. Um, the EU contribution to this process is a package of climate and energy laws to ensure reduction of emissions by 20 per cent relative to the 1990 level by 2020. It, this remains uh, um, an ambitious program and is unanimously supported by all 27 member states, including those heavily relying on coal. The package covers cap and trade, increased renewable energy, development of carbon capture and storage, and stringent auto emissions. We have reformed our carbon market rules on the basis of the lessons from the first phase. Our cap, and trade, our cap will get progressively tighter year on year. In principle, power plants will no longer receive any free allowances beyond 2012, thereby removing the potential for windfall profits. Auctioning will be introduced gradually for industrial sectors. To safeguard jobs and avoid carbon leakage in energy intensive sectors, we will identify sectors at risk on the basis of criteria and allow more free allocation of allowances pending 100% auctioning by 2027. Along with President Obama, we are convinced that measures to tackle climate change and economic recovery go hand in hand. If we do not address climate change now, we risk an irreversible climate crisis. Key developing countries have adopted strategies and plans, including China, Mexico and India. South Africa, for example, has set out proposals for substantial quantified deviation from baseline, in other words, from what they would otherwise be producing in CO2, uh, uh, enabled by, and are enabled in this by international funding and technology. We need to finance both adaptation and mitigation plans of the order of 224 billion globally for mitigation, over, over half of which will be in developing countries. And developing uh, con countries may need between 29 and 69 billion dollars per year by 2030 for adaptation. The significant amounts are, these, these, these amounts are small when compared with the cost of doing nothing. And Lord Stern put that at a figure of between 5 and 20 per cent of GDP by 2030. This calls for, obviously, increased public funding and substantial finance from both the private sector and developing countries themselves. Developed countries must provide finance and technology support for increased action in developing countries. So we welcome President Obama's long-term target of reducing emissions by 80% by 2050 and the early appointment of a highly qualified climate team in the administration and in, in the White House. We're encouraged also by the congressional timetables for getting draft legislation to a floor vote. Progress on robust domestic legislation in the United States is an essential step towards a comprehensive global agreement and political leadership is vital for achieving this. Last week, the European Commission set out its proposals for Copenhagen. It contains four main elements. Firstly, recognising that developed countries collectively need to reduce their emissions by 30% relative to 1990 levels and agreeing on the basis of criteria a fair distribution of effort between them on the basis of an international agreement. Secondly, agreed increased action from developing countries, as the ranking member has indicated. As a group, they need to collectively reduce their emissions by 15 to 30 per cent below business as usual by 2020. To achieve this, rather than require 
that developing countries commit to targets. We propose instead that each draws up a low carbon development strategy, which will serve as the basis for discussion with donors uh, to support specific actions in that strategy. Thirdly, a credible financial package is essential to ensure the significant increases uh, in public support uh, to developing countries to fulfil these commitments. And we identify two options for finding this finance um, and lay out uh, what it might mean. And fourthly, we suggest that, the car uh, that a carbon market, a carbon price, will be essential for securing cost-effective emissions and for redirecting finance. We foresee that there would be a robust international carbon market in parallel to the UN negotiations and that there should be EU-US cooperation on this. We also work, need to work together to establish precisely what is required from developing countries and hopefully between now and Copenhagen we can flesh that out. And we need furthermore and finally to reform the clean development mechanism um, to eliminate some of the concerns that have been identified uh, amongst others here by the ranking member. Uh, let me uh, begin by recognizing the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, Mr. Breton, uh, as I understand your testimony, uh, you are suggesting for the developing world um, action items, that, that the, the most achievable goal in Copenhagen would be to s essentially require a certain defined efforts by members of the developing world, as opposed to specific uh, targets which the developed world would embrace. Is that, is that generally what you're, what you're thinking? But we do also uh, require that, they, with that we identify what would be the level of emissions from each country on a business as usual basis and that the actions that they take would involve uh, reducing uh, by 2030 the trend in emissions to um, 15 to 30 percentage points below what business as usual would indicate. But we don't propose the specific binding targets of the kind that we believe are feasible in developed countries. The part of the problem here is that developing countries don't have the baseline data, don't have the monitoring arrangements that we, one needs to pursue rigid targets. Um, we need to develop that, and I think the proposals we make for refining the clean development mechanism would assist in developing countries in getting them to have the baseline monitoring and enforcement mechanisms in place in due course, but they're not ready yet. So, as I understand it, you would envision the agreement specifying certain action items that a developing country would need to take and those would be designed to achieve a certain reduction below baseline projections that would otherwise occur. That, that's generally the goal here that you well, think well, should be the vision? I, I don't think that it will be possible to negotiate in an international agreement specific actions for every one of the 100 or so countries in the world. What we would be requiring each one of them, though, to do by 2011 is produce a, car a low carbon development strategy, which where they would specify in, the, in that program the actions that they would be taking. And that, then their compliance with that and the adequacy of that program would be assessed internationally on an ongoing basis. Uh, but in the first instance, the actions would have to be identified by them rather than in the agreement. And do you think that, that uh, sanctions for non-compliance should have a good airing in Copenhagen? Um, Mr. Blumenauer referred to a, to a carbon tariff, if you will, and there's various other methods. Should that be discussed? Should there be a, some international sanction associated with outliers who would not enter into this international agreement? We believe that a cap and trade system involves automatic um, penalties for those who exceed certain caps. And more than half of our greenhouse gas emissions are already covered by our cap and trade system and we propose slightly to extend that by bringing in aviation as well. Um, 
As to, uh, and then internally in the European Union, we have for the rest of the emissions uh, a requirement to reduce by 10% um, as against the present level with a pre process of penalties for countries within the European Union that fail to achieve that part of the target. Um, the, the, the issue of a carbon tariff is, is one that I, I'm not sure I can can comment upon at this stage. One does not want to introduce disruptions to international trade that one can avoid uh, by other methods. And hopefully the negotiation, if the low carbon development strategies that are produced by the developing countries are adequate, should avoid that necessity. So let's assume, uh, I'll just push on this just a moment. Uh, let's assume that the, the, the Duchy of Fredonia just refuses to negotiate with the rest of the world, just period, just sticks its finger on the eye of the rest of the world, refuses to enter into any binding agreement. Let's assume that, you know, the vast majority of the rest of the world does and incurs certain obligations consistent with its own station in, in economic development. Isn't it a fair question to say, shouldn't, shouldn't the exports from that company country uh, carry some cost associated with its failure to abide by this global this global need for global action? Well, the first thing to say, I think, is that the major emitting countries are already committing themselves to move forward uh, on a basis that involves international commitments. Uh, in the hypothetical case that you postulate, one might eventually come to have to do something of the nature you describe. Um, but I think we shouldn't start there. Um, obviously, um, all participants in the negotiation know that what you have stated is an eventual possibility. Um, but I think that's probably something better kept in, in reserve rather than used up front. I th we, one must, I think, have faith in the commitments that the, we hope the countries will be making. Obviously, if countries make no commitments, and then it's demonstrable on the basis of objective criteria that their exports are obtaining an unfair competitive advantage, then perhaps certain measures uh, might be contemplated. But it's important that the criteria for, for measuring that would be objective, that there would actually have to be actual damage in the compliant countries uh, for measures to be adopted. I think punishment for punishment's sake is not an approach we should adopt. So we'll, we'll speak softly for a while, but we will keep a big stick out there. Thank you. Okay. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Welcome, and I'm sure this debate's going to be going on long after you and I depart from the scene. But uh, uh, let me uh, have a shot across the bow. You know, I'm I'm afraid that uh, uh, what you said in your uh, the European nations that you represent here uh, really haven't been listening for what's been going on uh, in this entire debate. Sunday's edition of the Indian newspaper, the Economic Times, quoted IPCC Chairman R.K. Pachuri as saying, quote, negotiations are going on for the conference of the parties where we will have a multilateral worldwide agreement. Of course, the developing countries will be exempted from any such restrictions, but the developed countries will certainly have to cut down on emissions, unquote. And last Thursday's issue of the Financial Times quoted top UN climate change bureaucrat Evo de Boer as saying, quote, I don't think developing countries will accept binding targets, unquote. What are your reactions to these statements and what they portend for this year's negotiations? Well, the first thing to say is, of course, the eventual agreement will be agreed between states. Um, and while the officers of the United Nations, whom you quote, will no doubt be helpful, uh, it's the agreement between states that will finally mm -hmm. be what will be effective. Um, I think there is a distinction here to be made between commitments to action and targets. Targets involve, um, as we understand them in the cap and trade mode, automatic sanctions in the event that one exceeds those targets. Commitments to action do involve eventually penalties, but the penalties are not automatic in the same way. There's a more uh, more iterative and discursive process internationally before any country might 
suffer mm-hmm. any direct consequence. But what they both have in common is that they both involve commitments by developing <coughs> countries as well as by developed countries. Obviously, these commitments, as no doubt you would agree, need to be differentiated relative uh, to their income and capacity. Well, you know, again, repeating the quote from Dr. Pachuri, he used the word, will be exempted from any such restrictions. And Mr. DeBoer said, uh, the developing world will it will not accept binding targets. Now, I read this to be the same. Uh, Senator Kerry at Bali uh, gave a speech that I agree with uh, that said that the U.S. Senate will not ratify a treaty that is not worldwide in application. Now, doesn't this mean that we are exactly where we were immediately post-Kyoto when... The treaty was so flawed that President Clinton, who did sign the treaty, never submitted it to the Senate for ratification? I think there is a necessity to draw some distinction between developing countries as a whole, some of which are growing quite fast and whose emissions are growing quite fast, and the least developed countries whose emissions are insignificant uh, and who are not in prospect of increasing those emissions very much. The main effort, I think, in the matter of securing binding commitments or securing commitments that can be pursued from the developing countries will be on the bigger number of Mm -hmm. countries that are not in the least developed category. And it may be that in the least developed category, the commitments Uh, will be as you described. uh, Mr. Ambassador, you know, you heard Mr. Inslee criticize me for blaming China. Uh, I've heard an awful lot of blame for to, uh, uh, China uh, from both sides of the aisle, a lot of which is, in my opinion, justified. Uh, by giving China, which now emits more greenhouse gases than does the United States, uh, another get-out-of-jail-free card, how do you sell that in Europe or in the United States, uh, given the fact that a lot of people have lost their jobs as a result of competition from China? I don't think you could sell that. I don't think there will be a get-out-of-jail-free card for China. I Mm. think China already has indicated itself that it's prepared to take action. Its auto standards, for example, are more rigorous than the auto standards that apply here. Um, They recognize that they need to do a lot about carbon capture and storage, in particular because of their heavy reliance on coal. We need to assist them as best we can technologically to develop Mm. in that direction. But there will be no get-out-of-jail-free card for... Have have, have the Chinese used... Used uh, the money that Europe has sent them by buying carbon offset credits exclusively uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, or have they just used that money for something that uh, uh, ends up having the uh, same effect of increasing the emissions? Well, I heard the example that you quoted in your opening statement, and um, I think we would all recognize that there have been some deficiencies in the clean development mechanism, and there is room for improvement, and we have made proposals to improve it, to eliminate the possibility of of Uh, the sort of thing you describe happening. I'll I'll, I'll just respond since my time is up, as the Chinese have more ways of saying no than any other society in the earth. Thank you. (laughs) Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But I'd, I'd like to just follow up the last two lines of inquiry, um, I think raise uh, uh, interesting and important points. I'd like to go back to the potential of a carbon tariff, uh, not as something that is uh, punitive and uh, uh, trying to complicate the situation, but if we establish a regimen where uh, there is a disincentive for people to export their pollution or import it from someone else, it would seem to me uh, that that would add to the desire that we all have to have a a global, uh, transparent, effective, reasonable, fair system that treats everybody the same, particularly if some of the carbon tariff uh, recovery were used to accent and accelerate the technological conversion that we need. Um, 
I'm, I'd like to explore a little further with you whether or not there isn't a potential here of complementing our, our global climate change goals by having a framework that ensures that um, there are uh, mechanisms to discourage people from exporting uh, their carbon pollution and importing it to others. The European Commission certainly recognizes that this problem potentially exists. Um, we have proposed a way of dealing with it in our uh, proposals which would involve um, giving free allowances to sectors under the cap and trade system if those sectors can be demonstrated to be potentially victims of unfair competition from um, other countries which yeah. are uh, enjoying greater freedom to Im increase could, could emissions. I, could I just but we haven't gone as far as a carbon yeah, tariff. But could I just, following up on that, I, I, under I understand that you'd have a mechanism to try and hold harmless or, or reduce the, the damage uh, to one of your local industries because taking Mr. Sensenbrenner's example, somebody in China is cutting corners or just ignoring it. But what that does is that it compounds the problem because you have somebody who's cheating and then you give an extra allowance to somebody to make up for the cheating as opposed to having a mechanism whereby the cheater loses their competitive advantage and the tariff is used to try and accelerate the technological conversion. Um, well, the, the, the effect is pretty well the same because if you give free allowances to one exposed sector, then obviously there are less allowances available to buy for the sectors that are not exempted. So their costs for buying allowances will increase. And that's, in a sense, the same effect as you achieve by a tariff. What a tariff does is increase domestic prices for impo of imported goods. So we just are using a different method to shift the cost to the rest of the economy to the benefit of the exposed sector. Um, that's, that's, the, that's the merit, if you like, of having a cap-and-trade system that has enabled you to do that sort of thing without uh, resort to tariffs. But uh, this is a negotiation, and the United States obviously is free to advance ideas in this area, and uh, I'm sure the European Union countries will look at it, look at those ideas. But as of now, we don't believe that's the best way to go ourselves. Thank you. Um, the targets, um, trying to uh, go back to 1990 levels, um, slight difference of, um, of just even for the United States. Uh, our population has increased 19% since 1990. I think we're looking at uh, uh, a number of European countries that are not <coughs> so blessed or um, cursed or uh, with uh, increasing population appear to distort slightly uh, the equities. Um, any thoughts about what, wh where we establish uh, a baseline that uh, is fair and reasonable? Yes, we recognize this problem. And in the proposals that we have made for Copenhagen, we have said that the criteria for distributing the burden um, between uh, developed countries uh, would, would vary uh, on the basis of GDP per capita. In other, the, in other words, a richer country would have to bear a greater burden than a smaller one. G greenhouse gas emissions per capita, those who are already emitting more would have to reduce a little more. Uh, trends in emissions in recent times, the extent to which countries have already met the Kyoto targets would also be a factor in their favour. But finally and fourthly and very importantly addressing your point, population trends. If a country has a trend of increasing population, inevitably that's going to involve increasing tendency to emit. And obviously that would have to be taken into account in favour of the country that ha could show that its population was increasing. So I expect that the United States um, would be accommodated substantially on that point because of the more rapid population growth you have here than is the case in most, if not all, European countries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, 
And we will go a second round if that is the will of the members in asking questions. Um, <clears throat> let me let me ask this question, if if I uh, may. Uh, the your the original European emissions trading plan was criticized for over allocation and windfall profits. Uh, you mentioned that in your opening statement. Could you expand upon the problems you identified and now the corrections which you have put into place in order to deal with um, the um, the problem areas that you identified in that uh, original uh, plan? Well, Mr. Chairman, as, as you indicated, we, we simply allocated too many um, too many. Uh, emissions trading permits, and as a result, uh, the value of these permits fell very fast, and therefore the emissions trading system in its first three-year period didn't achieve what it was intended to achieve because of that error in calculation. Um, and that arose principally because we didn't have enough data, or accurate data, at the beginning to make the allocations more realistic, but in the second um, the second phase, which runs up to uh, 2012, we have much more realistic targets because we've been able to use the information gained in the first phase to make those targets more realistic. And in the second phase, we will be reducing uh, greenhouse gases by six percentage points. And then in the third phase, we propose even more uh, rigorous uh, reductions with a reduction of 1.75 percentage points per annum uh, in, in, em in emissions. So the, the error uh, that was made in the beginning will be remedied. I think it is fair to say that the European Union is the first to attempt to put a carbon, uh, ca a carbon trading system in place. And we're, we are learning as we're going along, and um, hopefully others will be able to, to learn from our mistakes. And we don't regard that as anything bad, but good instead. And, and, and could you expand a little bit more on the uh, clean development mechanism and the cooperation that could be fostered between the United States and the EU in this uh, area? And uh, if you could, again, expand more on this offset marketplace that, um, that uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner uh, referred to as well. Well, as, as, as uh, I, I indicated in, in my opening remarks and in response to um, the ranking member, <coughs> we do recognise that there were uh, deficiencies in the scheme as it operated initially. The uh, monitoring and enforcement mechanisms were not as good as they ought to be. And we have um, tabled uh, proposals to improve uh, the, the clean development uh, mechanism. Um, I, I would be happy to supply a more detailed briefing to the committee on precisely how we envisage the clean development mechanism being being improved. I fear that if I were to attempt to summarize it now, I might not do so with complete accuracy. Um, and if, if you could, you also referred to the Stern report. Um, this. Um, this is the insight that if we don't act, it could cost um, the EU, the United States, more in the long run than if we act now, even though uh, some are criticizing the impact that it might have upon economies today. Could you expand upon that insight of the Stern report and the extent to which the EU has embraced that insight? We have embraced this insight fully. The Stern report estimates that if we don't act now to limit uh, climate uh, change, that the if damage to our economies through the various phenomena that would arise, including massive loss of water supplies affecting food supplies, um, for example, a lot of the conflicts in the world are currently taking place in places where water is deficient in supply relative to population. Uh, if global warming occurs, that strife will get worse. Uh, but the overall estimate that has been made is that failure to act would involve a loss in global GDP of five percentage points every year into the future and possibly up to 20 percentage points of a loss of global GDP every year into the future. 
um, that's uh, relatively high by comparison to the costs of doing something, which the Stern uh, study indicated could be limited to one percentage point of GDP as against five to 20 percentage points. Uh, there's no doubt that action will cost money. Um, if you, for example, build a, a coal-fired plant that has a carbon capture and storage built in, that could add on present technologies between 30 and 80 percent to the cost of the of the plant. Um, but uh, very good work has been done in particular here in the United States. I was in Pittsburgh yesterday visiting the centre where they're doing this work to put in place technologies that would reduce the cost of carbon capture and storage uh, very substantially and enable coal to be used to the full without damaging uh, the environment. And obviously we must work together on those technologies. And I believe that the uh, carbon capture, and, sorry, the cap and trade system will release the, the funds that would enable us to finance the sorts of research that's being done uh, in centres like the one I visited yesterday in Pittsburgh. Uh, thank you very much. Let me turn and recognise uh, the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Inslee, once again. Mr. Ambassador, you've heard a little bipartisan exchange about this. I want to make sure that we're unified and and I'm, I want to preserve and defend my my friend, Mr. Sensenbrenner's right to criticize China and other countries in the developing world. Uh, we, we have a bipartisan consensus on that. But I, I want you to know that uh, uh, the point I want to leave with you is that some of us here feel we'll be in a better position to criticize China and a much stronger negotiating position and a much more morally persuasive position if we do move ahead forward in the United States. And I I, I, I'm trying to help Mr. Senator even be a bigger and better and more successful critic of, of Chinese actions. Uh, if we adopt a cap and trade system, he will be at the pinnacle of critical. Uh, well, the gentleman yield. Sure, certainly. Thanks, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I wanted to make that point clear. Uh, I want to ask you uh, the the. Uh, uh, a suggestion has been made that, that the principals, the, the heads of state, meet in the spring before Copenhagen. That suggestion has been floated out there by the leader of the UN. Uh, what does the Europe think about that idea? Yes, I, I think this one suggestion that has been advanced as well by uh, Prime Minister Gordon Brown in Britain is that there might be a discussion in the margins of the G20 summit, which is principally concerned with the... Um, overall economic crisis that the world is facing, that they might meet in the margins of that to review progress uh, in preparation for Copenhagen. Um, I don't know whether the other parties will agree to this or whether the United States would be happy with it, but it seems to me to be wise to move forward in parallel and in conjunction on the two issues because uh, we can't really separate what we need to do to deal with the long-term problem of global warming from what we also need to do with the short-term problem, uh, hopefully short-term problem of the financial crisis. The two uh, ac ac fields of action should be synchronized to the maximum degree possible. Great. Thank you. I want to ask you this idea. You were talking about sort of, we're talking about, you know, common responsibility and differentiated actions according to our specific economic conditions. And anybody who's seen Slumdog Millionaire uh, which is a great movie, highly recommended, two thumbs up from Congress, at least one of us. Um, you know, you look at the kids living in, the, nine million kids living in Mumbai in less than a dollar a day and struggling to get water and maybe a little piece of bread somewhere along during the day. And you ask yourself, you know, what should I ask that kid to do or that family to do in relationship to their global warming emissions compared to what I should ask my family to do? And my family's emissions are probably eight or nine times higher than his family's on a per head basis. My family's are six times higher than the, or five times higher than the typical Chinese on a per capita basis. Actually, I heard Prime Minister Singh, contrary to what's been said here, I've heard Prime Minister Singh saying, yes, they already have agreed to a limit, a binding target on CO2. India has said, we commit to the world, we will never... Uh, emit more per capita than the average per capita emissions of anyone in the world. They have made a commitment to do that already, a binding commitment, if you will. Uh, so I guess the question is, could you expand on how we should 
define our individual commitments? How, how do we distinguish the commitment the slumdog millionaire should make before he wins all the 20 million rupees uh, compared to what you know, my family should make? How, what, you know, what formula should we use to distinguish our, our commitments in that regard? I saw the movie too, and I'm glad it had a happy ending. <laughs> um, yeah, you'll notice. I hope this saga has a happy ending. Yeah. <laughs> by the way, she didn't kiss the guy until he had the 20 million rupees, by the way. <laughs> yes, I did notice that. Right. Um, the, 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 um, the, I think that what's important is that every member state that's a party to the agreement has a sense of ownership of the targets, that they feel that these are targets that they have themselves devised, or these are commitments or actions that they have themselves devised and committed to. Um, therefore, I'm not so sure that it's wise at this point for us to say what the Indians should do or for us to say what the Bangladeshis should do. Each must you know, devise their own plan and have that plan then peer-reviewed by other countries and hopefully accepted and monitored on a peer review basis as to its implementation. I think that's the best approach to adopt so that everybody feels that they have ownership of the problem and of the solution. Um, I would also underline the point that you've made by saying that it is the least developed countries that will suffer the greatest immediate impacts of global warming. Africa, where desertification will be accelerated. Bangladesh, where potentially millions upon millions of people will simply find their homes disappear under water eventually as a result of an increasing frequency of flooding as a, connected with increased sea levels. Uh, so. I, I think it is, it is important that everybody act, everybody have a sense of urgency, and everybody have a sense of ownership of their own program as part of an international framework. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, the commitment that Prime Minister Singh of India made, when you add up the figures, is really not a commitment at all. Because if you look at the per capita emissions of the 300 million people in the United States, uh, and then you look at the per capita emissions of India in total and recognize that there are a billion plus people uh, that live in India, India has got a long ways to go. Uh, what I heard, <coughs> excuse me, heard uh, when we were both uh, in New Delhi uh, was that the top priority of India was to provide electricity to the half of the population that doesn't have it yet. Uh, and that's going to require a lot of generation, and it's going to require generation that is largely fueled by fossil fuels of one kind or another. So I know that we're using the same figures to come to two different conclusions. I think my picture is a little bit broader, and that is what confirms uh, what is stated in the chart over there that was done by the Patel Institute that essentially says that even if the first world reduces their emissions to zero by 2050 without the type of mandatory restrictions uh, that the third world is talking about being unacceptable, we simply will have just about the same growth of greenhouse gas emissions and greenhouse gases uh, uh, in the atmosphere as we have now. That being said, um, we've heard quite a bit about the clean development mechanism. Uh, I talked about the German firm buying credits uh, from a Chinese, uh, uh, the, really the Chinese government, because that's everything that goes on there, for a dam that was under construction for uh, two years before the credits were even dreamed up. And there's a case of an Indian chemical company named SRF that was getting uh, 50 to $60 million worth of credits for burning refrigerator gases in a very cheap uh, incinerator. And that's somewhere around a half a billion dollars that uh, they would be getting. So uh, I, I, I wonder, you know, how good the clean development mechanism will be in coming up with cost-effective ways of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. My question, Mr. Ambassador, is this, is how much money have the member states of the European Union sent outside the EU to buy these credits? And what kind of effect does the EU believe that that money has done? 
and using these two specific examples uh, uh, as a case in point? Um, I re regret to say I don't have the figure that you're speaking, mm -hmm. but I will obtain it for you. Um, I would also acknowledge that there have been deficiencies in the way the clean development mechanism has operated in the past, and we are committed to improving those mm. to ensure, in particular, that any project which benefits from a clean development mechanism fund uh, dis uh, disposal is genuinely additional to what would otherwise take place. Um, that it involves a net reduction in emissions relative to what might otherwise take place, and that that's ver verified. And also moving away from giving the money to specific projects, but rather giving it to sectors um, in developing countries. So, well, what you're, what you're saying, Mr. Ambassador, is that there have been some big problems with the way it's been working to date. I, I am saying that. Uh, now, I cannot be more specific than I've just but been in explaining how the improvements we would make would work and I would feel it would be helpful to the committee if I could okay. dig more deeply. I, 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 I accept that. However, I noticed about a year ago the Times of London uh, said that as a result of uh, the Commission ratcheting down the cap that over half the credits that the British electric industry would have to buy would come from outside of the European Union. And doesn't this mean that the clean development mechanism is turning into a wealth transfer from the first world, and specifically Europe, that's trying to do the right thing, to the third world, which kept, keeps on parsing words and figuring out how to avoid being under the same type of reduction regime that everybody wants the first world to be under. Well, that is true, but it is also the case that one can achieve bigger reductions in emissions more cheaply uh, in countries that have not yet developed facilities than if you spend the same money re-engineering re existing facilities in developed countries. But with, without a cap, what incentive is there for the countries that get this money, and again, I'll talk about China and India, uh, to actually do what both you and I want them to do. There really isn't an incentive to do that. Well, the developing countries will all, in our proposal, have to commit to low-carbon development strategies, which will involve strict commitments to certain actions that they will take. And they will have to collect data, and eventually, on the basis of that data, one hopes that they will also be able to participate in uh, the cap-and-trade system. Uh, maybe not immediately, but as we go down the road. And to the extent that it is cheaper to reduce emissions in developing countries than in developed countries, it may actually be profitable for some of these countries to want to go into the cap-and-trade system because they will tend to oh. benefit from it relatively soon. Well, my, my view of the CDM is so far to date they've taken the money and run. My time is up, so I yield back my deficit. Great. Thank the uh, gentleman. Does the gentlelady from... Tennessee, have any questions you'd like to ask? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have one one item I wanted to um, bring to you and hear from you on, Mr. Ambassador, and thank you very much for your time and for coming to talk with us. Um, the, the tariffs, and we have spent, and especially in my my state and in my district, we talk a lot about trade and the importance of trade. So as you look at the agreement, um, what if a country decides not to agree and to the agreement and uh, tariffs that would be put on? And how do you see that interfacing with the WTO? Would there be some WTO violations? Have you thought through the tariff situation there? And if countries are outside of the agreement, and um, have you given thought to that? And that is more or less thinking out loud with you, but I would like to hear where you all are on that. And Mr. Chairman, that's the only question that I have, and after his answer, I'll yield back. Great. As of this point, the European Commission and the European Union is not uh, putting forward any proposal for tariffs. We have within the modifications we propose to make to our internal cap-and-trade system made provision to help out any uh, 
uh, industry that in our jurisdiction can be demonstrated to be suffering from unfair competition from a country that is either not party to the agreement or is able to produce more cheaply simply because of the availability of because they're not under the same constraints as as our producers are um, but um, we don't uh, exclude this completely as a possibility uh, but I think it's important important to say that we have all benefited from the open trading system in the world and introducing a new basis for the imposition of tariffs, uh, which could lead to a lot of litigation, um, might not necessarily be the best way to get the sort of commitment that we need from these countries to take the action we want them to take. Um, and I therefore feel that the approach of requiring them to produce low carbon development strategies, which commit them to specific actions, which would be monitored, is a better approach to getting to where we want to get to than threatening them with tariffs at this stage. Uh, but I, I, at the end of the day, um, they know and we know that that recourse is available in the event that no other recourse is effective. General Lady's time has expired. Um, <clears throat> uh, we thank you, sir. And perhaps you could, for a minute or two, just summarize what it is that you would like us to know about what the European community is doing and is planning to do in order to uh, lead on the issue of climate change and what your expectations are and hopes for the United States in that effort. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The European Union has already committed itself unanimously to imposing internal constraints on itself of an increasing severity to reduce our emissions. And we are now seeking, in conjunction with the United States, to work with you to create a global carbon market that will put a price on carbon, and by putting a price on carbon, incentivize research and development and action to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, we believe that the nexus between the United States and the European Union is essential if there's to be a success in Copenhagen. And uh, we regard the fact that you have taken the trouble to invite me to speak here is a very good sign that we are on a convergent track as far as this is concerned. And I'm very grateful to you and to the members for giving me such a generous hearing. Uh, we thank you, sir. It's our honor to uh, have you with us today. Uh, it, it is clear that the cost of inaction is greater than the cost of action. Uh, it's also clear that uh, the developing world and the industrialized world must act together, although in different ways, uh, towards solving this problem. And we want to work with you uh, throughout this year uh, towards the harmonization of uh, our efforts in order to give leadership to the rest of the world, which is necessary to solve this problem. So we thank you, sir. It's our uh, honor to have had you here. Thank you. And we have a, a second panel. Uh, which will also uh, now please move up to uh, the witness uh, table and um, would ask our first witness uh, when he is ready to begin with his five minutes of opening uh, testimony. And that would be Elliot uh, Derringer, who is the Vice President of International Strategies for the Pew Center on Global Climate Change. Mr. Uh, Derringer served in the Clinton administration as Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy Press Secretary. He now directs uh, the uh, Pew Center's um, uh, uh, outreach to key, government, uh, key governments and actors involved in international climate change negotiations. Mr. Derringer, whenever you're ready, please begin. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. In summarizing my written testimony, I'd like to emphasize four points. The progress made since Bali, what is needed in a post-2012 climate framework, what will constitute success this year in Copenhagen, and how the United States can best ensure that success. While global greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise at an alarming rate, governments have made important progress since the Bali conference. Ambassador Bruton has just described efforts underway in Europe. 
Other developed countries also are moving forward. Australia is planning a cap and trade system and other measures to reduce its emissions up to 15 percent by 2020, and Japan will announce its own midterm target later this year. Even more encouraging is that several major developing countries have now adopted national climate strategies. China, which adopted a national climate program in 2007, was joined last year by India, Brazil, Mexico, and South Africa. Brazil is proposing to reduce deforestation rates 70 percent by 2017. Mexico has set an aspirational goal of reducing emissions 50 percent by 2050, and South Africa has pledged to stop its, its emissions growth by 2025, with absolute reductions to begin 10 years later. Internationally as well, we've seen progress since Bali. President Bush and other G8 leaders supported a global goal to reduce emissions at least 50 percent by 2050. In the major economies summit, China, India, and other major developing countries acknowledge that their emissions must deviate from business as usual. And in the UN climate negotiations, governments have put forward dozens of concrete proposals for fashioning a comprehensive post-2012 agreement. In anticipation of new U.S. leadership, governments resolved two months ago in Poznan, Poland, to shift this year into full negotiating mode. After years of stalemate, conditions are finally set for a genuine negotiation to begin. The Pew Center believes that to be effective, a post-2012 climate agreement must establish verifiable commitments by all major economies, including economy-wide emission targets for developed countries and a range of policy commitments for developing countries. We see four major challenges between now and Copenhagen. The first is agreeing on a range of comparable emission targets for developed countries. President Obama has called for reducing U.S. emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. The European Union, as we've just heard, has set a target of 20 percent below 1990 levels. Measured against the 1990 baseline, these goals appear very much at odds. However, circumstances today are different. Measured against the more current baseline, these goals appear considerably more comparable. Both, in fact, would reduce emissions roughly 15 percent below 2005 levels. Targets under consideration in Australia, Canada, and Japan fall in a similar range. The second challenge is defining developing country actions in a way that works for developing countries and can be accepted by the United States and other developed countries as a genuine commitment. Developing countries are not prepared at this stage to assume economy-wide targets. Commitments to implement nationally defined policies, such as energy intensity goals, efficiency standards, or sectoral targets are a reasonable alternative, provided that these policies are defined in clear metrics and produce verifiable emission reductions. The third major challenge is agreeing on the appropriate means and level of support for developing country action. Mobilizing support will be difficult under current economic conditions, but early progress in this area will be essential to reaching agreement in Copenhagen. The fourth major challenge is deciding how countries' efforts are to be measured and verified. A credible verification system is key to establishing and maintaining parties' confidence in their efforts and the overall regime. We cannot hope to fully resolve all of these issues in the next 10 months. As such, we believe that the Copenhagen Conference should be considered a major success if it produces a strong interim agreement that puts a full, final, and ratifiable treaty within reach. This interim agreement should do three things. It should establish the basic architecture of a post-2012 framework. It should indicate the range of emission reductions and level of support that developed countries are prepared to commit to, and it should initiate a process to determine the specific actions to be undertaken by developing countries. This would settle fundamental legal and design issues and create a positive dynamic for concluding a final agreement. To ensure success in Copenhagen, the United States must first and foremost lead at home by quickly enacting comprehensive mandatory legislation to reduce U.S. emissions. The United States must also lead abroad through a full-fledged diplomatic strategy. Congress can help strengthen the hand of U.S. negotiators through its design of domestic climate legislation. Congress could, for instance, authorize immediate assistance for capacity building in developing countries with assistance for technology deployment to be made available upon U.S. ratification and entry into force of a new climate agreement. Similarly, Congress could set aside allowance auction revenues to be made available on entry into force for emission reductions overseas above and beyond 
beyond a U.S. domestic target. The targets set under domestic legislation must fundamentally guide the U.S. negotiating position, but room to bargain could provide the negotiating leverage needed to secure stronger commitments from others. I thank you for this opportunity and be happy to answer your questions. We thank you very much, uh, Mr. Derringer. Our second witness is Rob Bradley. He's the director of the International Climate Policy Initiative at the World Resources Institute. Mr. Bradley, a trained physicist, now manages a variety of projects, including clean energy technologies for poverty reduction and adaptation strategies for climate change. We welcome you, Mr. Bradley. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, thank you and good morning. Um, my name is Rob Bradley. I'm director of the International Climate Policy Initiative at the World Resources Institute. Um, thank you for the opportunity to join you today. I would like to make three points, each of which I treat in more detail in my written testimony, which I hope can be included in the record. First, success against climate change will mean both strong federal policy in the United States and action from major developed and developing economies. Second, the world has changed dramatically from the days of the Kyoto Protocol major developing countries are ready to take significant action on limiting emissions. Third, the Bali Action Plan provides a solid foundation for a new international agreement that meets key U.S. interests. The United States is an indispensable leader in the fight against climate change. Without the world's largest economy and biggest historical emitter, other countries cannot fix the problem. But nor can the U.S. do it alone. Almost 80% of global emissions are produced by 15 countries, counting the EU as one country, nine of which are in the developing world. The Kyoto Protocol, the main climate agreement to date, has been re rejected by the US in particular because of the concern that without meaningful participation from major developing countries, it would be ineffective and excessively costly to the US economy. Developing countries have historically argued that with their poverty and small historical contribution to the climate problem, they should not be responsible for curbing emissions. But in recent years, there has been a flood of developing country climate plans. For example, Brazil announced that it would reduce its deforestation rate over 50% from recent levels by 2017, avoiding an estimated 4.8 billion tons of CO2 emissions. China committed to reducing national energy intensity, that's energy use per unit of GDP, by 20% by 2010 and looks on course to meet that goal, with programs expected to cut emissions by 550 million tons of CO2. Investment in wind, hydro, nuclear and biomass are expected to save an additional 640 million tons by 2010. India has a number of states that are taking forward aggressive renewable energy targets with renewable portfolio standards. Mexico aims to halve its greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and is considering a cap, employing a cap-and-trade policy akin to the one recently considered by U.S. Congress. South Africa has presented a detailed and highly ambitious plan to peak its national emissions by 2020 and to bring them down to low levels in 2050 in accordance with the science. These policies will often not be of the same form as the cap-and-trade approach favored in the U.S. and Europe, but that need not make them any less ambitious. They are the more impressive when we consider the poverty of many of these countries. As has already been mentioned, in India, 550 million people still lack any access to electricity, and they, just like Americans and Europeans in the last century, legitimately aspire to get it. But they are seeking to do so on a lower carbon pathway. Indeed, countries such as China and India see their future as leaders in the clean energy revolution. Significant questions do remain. Many of these countries have a poor record of implementing national plans. Reliable data are hard to obtain. Standards of enforcement, governance and transparency are very variable. It will certainly not be enough um, for countries to take each other's plans at face value. And this is where the international agreement comes in. It must enhance collective willingness to act by establishing accountability to build trust that countries are taking real action to cut emissions and framing those actions in the context of global goals. The Bali Action Plan provides for a radically different agreement from the Kyoto Protocol. Mitigation actions from both developed and developing countries are to be, quote, measurable, reportable, and verifiable, end quote. This language also applies to finance, technology, and capacity building support to developing countries. This body can shape the success of the international process. Most importantly, adopting an ambitious federal climate policy will unleash action not only in the U.S., uh, but also from countries that, had, that have been waiting on the world's biggest economy. Second, U.S. policy should include provisions for financing international action on adaptation, forest protection, and clean technologies. I don't want to imply that this will be easy. 
Many countries remain wary of commitments, and their rhetoric will stress these fears. But the world has moved on a lot in 10 years. There is a real willingness to tackle emissions and a potential agreement that can turn this willingness into verifiable action. For the United States and for the world, the time is right to rise to this challenge. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Bradley, very much. <clears throat> and our final witness is Ms. Karen Alderman Harbert, who is the President and CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Institute for 21st Century Energy. Uh, prior to her time at the Institute, Ms. Harbert served as the Assistant Secretary for Policy and International Affairs at the U.S. Department of Energy. We welcome you, Ms. Harbert. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey and Ranking Member Sensenbrenner and other members of the committee for holding today's very important hearing on climate change. Climate change is undoubtedly one of the most complex issues facing the international community today, and I want to focus on some of the major challenges to a new agreement and where I believe the U.S. needs to play a constructive role. However, it's important to keep in mind the global context in which these negotiations are occurring has changed. The world has changed considerably since the UNFCCC was launched in 1992. Energy demand is going to increase by 50% between now and 2030, and 75% of that growth is going to be in the developing world. Next year, CO2 emissions from the industrialized nations will account for 47% of emissions. The developing world will be 53%. In 2030, that will be a very different picture. The industrialized world will be 38%, and the, the developing world, excuse me, will be 62%. So to be effective, therefore, any new arrangement should take into account changing trends in global, global economic development, energy demand, and emissions. The old model of donor and recipient countries simply will no longer work. Climate change needs to be addressed as part of an integrated agenda that proceeds from a clear understanding that for many countries, energy security is a greater concern right now than climate change. And too often, energy is vilified in these international discussions. Yet in reality, affordable energy is central to addressing climate change because it underpins economic growth, which is necessary to drive technology creation and deployment and definitely environmental protection. International strategies that recognize the reality can raise the level of trust between and among developed and developing nations. In addition, in these negotiations, which were going to be very difficult to begin with under the very best of circumstances, are now complicated further by the recent financial crisis. Looking ahead, the U.S. must be the voice of reason in these negotiations. Permeating much of these negotiations is an air of unreality that ultimately could derail an agreement. Unachievable emission reduction targets, the weakening of intellectual property protections, and unrealistic demands for financial support, for example, are now all on the negotiating table. We must temper our ambition with realism, which means that while we promote a positive pro-growth agenda that will attract developed and developing nations and will improve environmental stewardship, we must also be willing to walk away from a bad deal. Further, to ensure our economy retains its competitiveness, any new domestic climate policy should be conditioned on an international agreement that has full international participation. The idea that if the U.S. goes first, China and India and other nations will follow is just simply an unjustified article of faith that carries with it tremendous economic risk and potentially no environmental benefit. We've seen with the Kyoto Protocol that top-down approaches simply do not work. A new agreement needs to accommodate a wide range of national circumstances and approaches, and it should be very simple to implement and oversee. A long-term global emissions reduction goal should be realistic, achievable, and take into account emerging science, the pace of technology development and diffusion, and should not undermine economic growth or simply shift jobs or pollution overseas. To be effective, a new agreement must include the participation of countries like China and India. In that regard, the Bali Roadmap was very welcome in that we saw an indication of their willingness to participate in activities that were measurable, verifiable, and reportable. A new arrangement should include commitments by all countries in accordance with the common but differentiated responsibilities. However, we should not use that as a, as a source for inaction. We believe the notion of responsibilities and capabilities ought to evolve as economic conditions evolve and countries evolve, and we must recognize that countries should graduate from developing to develop status. At the cornerstone of any success is technology development and deployment, and that will determine how quick and how costly any future agreement will be. 
We know that the world will use coal, will use natural gas, will use oil, and we must fashion policies to accommodate their exploitation in the developing world, yet being mindful of environmental stewardship. We, of course, are paying close attention to China and the G77 weaken intellectual property as part of their proposal. We have to resolve what place nuclear power and carbon capture, storage, and sequestration will be in any new agreement. We can lead by example, and we can accelerate nuclear power in this country, and we can invest seriously in CO2 carbon capture and storage. So we have opportunities to exert leadership here at home by making wise, smart energy policy choices. And through the WTO, we should eliminate tariff and non-tariff barriers to environmental goods and services, which will lower the cost of any eventual agreement. But it's important that climate change not be invoked as an excuse to erect tariff barriers to gain competitive advantage or redistribute wealth. And we also have to remember that financing is critical. This will not be cost free, as Ambassador Bruton said. We need international concessionary financing and we need to relook at the financial, financial instrumentation we have here at home. So in sum, what would a new international approach look like? The following eight principles. It should consider growing energy needs, circumstances, and resource endowments of all countries. It should set realistic and achievable goals. It should strike a good balance between environmental protection, energy security, and economic growth. It should ensure global participation. It should allow for diversified approaches. It should ensure that mitigation actions are all measurable, reportable, and verifiable. And it should place technology at the cornerstone while protecting intellectual property and the rule of law. We should keep business at the table. We should keep the energy sector at the table because they will be key to the success of any ultimate agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harbert, very much. Now we turn to recognize the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. <clears throat> uh, thank you. I'd like to ask about alternative ways to deal with uh, the situation if, if countries do not enter into this in new international framework. Um, we've heard some discussion of potential, Mr. Blumenauer, throughout the idea of some tariffs to, to be um, uh, uh, an adjustment. Let's assume that a country X does not er enter into this international agreement. The possibility is to have some tariff associated with their failure to do so, associated with the costs of noncompliance. Um, Mike Doyle and I are working on an approach a little different that would essentially provide free permits to energy intensive industries as an approach to prevent leakage uh, overseas. It wouldn't be directed to any one com uh, country. It would simply say that energy intensive industries would receive some free uh, permits as opposed to having to buy them at what many of us hope to be an, uh, an effective auction. I just wonder if you would like to comment on those two different approaches. Uh, Mr. Derringer, you'd like to speak? Thank you, Mr. Inslee. Um, well, let me distinguish between two scenarios then. One, uh, domestic action uh, in, in uh, anticipation of an international agreement, and the second scenario being once we've reached an international agreement. Um, I, I think uh, in the first scenario, uh, the approach you and Mr. Doyle have put forward seems rather workable. Uh, in our analysis of potential competitiveness impacts, uh, they actually appear reasonably modest um, and can be addressed through the allocation process. Uh, Ambassador Britton described how Europe has chosen to go that route. Uh, Australia also is using free allocation to energy intensive industries to address this issue. Uh, and we would prefer that to the uh, imposition of border measures, unilateral border measures, uh, in the absence of an international agreement. Um, assuming uh, that we are able to achieve an international agreement, it seems as if there are two options. Uh, one would be to try to structure into the agreement uh, the use of some types of tariffs or border measures as a means either to enforce the agreement uh, or as a tool uh, to encourage action by parties that have not yet entered into the agreement. Uh, the other option would be not to have those as an explicit tool of the agreement, uh, but for countries, again, to choose to do that unilaterally, but now with an agreement in place. Um, either of those options, assuming that an agreement in place, to my understanding, uh, would be more effective and more legitimate under the WTO uh, 
than choosing to go the route of unilateral trade measures in the absence of an international agreement. I, I, sh I should emphasize I, I'm not an attorney and by no means a WTO expert, but uh, uh, my understanding, again, is that uh, if parties have reached an international environmental agreement, uh, then the use of trade measures either as a, a means of enforcing that agreement uh, or as a unilateral tool um, to guard countries against impacts uh, would be both more legitimate and more effective. Uh, thank you. I'm going to just take Mr. Dillinger's answer. It kind of covered several things because I wanted to ask another question. Um, let me start with Ms. Herbert if I can. Uh, uh, I really appreciated your comment about trying to drive technology as the answer to this problem. It's one thing I wholeheartedly embrace and I appreciate you bringing that up. But I want to ask you about what you believe what your organization believes should be the relative contributions of the world's citizens to this problem. So I'll invite you to play Slumdog Millionaire with me for a minute. Um, take two world citizens, one in India, one in Mumbai, one living on a dollar a day with not no legal place to live, and then a middle class American living in the first congressional district where I live. Um, my constituents, myself included, emit about 10 times more per capita than the slumdog millionaire. So I guess the question is, what do you think our relative expectations should be of one another in this international agreement? How, how should we quantify that? Should they be dependent on our gross net domestic products? What, you know, what should we expect each other? Should we have the same per capita emissions, in which case Indians could go up by five, factor of five, and ours come down by 50%? That seems not very attractive to me, uh, but it might be seen as fair to the Indians. In fact, Prime Minister Singh has said as much. What, what do you think it should be? Well, first of all, the first thing I'm going to do after this hearing is go see the movie, since obviously Great. we're in Hamilton. <laughs> so. uh, first of all, we want to presume that, that any agreement that anybody ever is going to be party to is going to be a success. In order for it to be a success, it has to be binding, and therefore mm -hmm. there have to be responsibilities that everybody is going to agree to. There is a precursor agreement that the developing world the, the, uh, will have common but differentiated responsibilities. But if there's a binding agreement, that means that over time those will increase. And so we have to be willing willing to sit at a table and look across the table at our counterparts in the developing world and have them agree to binding agreements. Therefore, uh, it will not be incumbent and, and our taxpayers and our citizens will not be the ones paying continuously over time for the compliance of the developing world. If we erect tariff barriers at our borders because either they have not signed on to an agreement or they're not in compliance with their uh, agreements, that basically is just going to put on the burden of the American citizen uh, that cost. And that would be unfair, whether it's in your district or anybody else's district, that we are paying for the failure of the agreement and it's either an enforcement or whether it was just never uh, successfully in a negotiated to begin with. So we have to recognize the aspirations of the developing world. They have a right to develop, but they also have an obligation to enter into uh, a binding enforceable agreement that will really and materially reduce uh, greenhouse, gish, greenhouse gas emissions over time. If they do not participate, we will not succeed. So if the goal is to succeed, they have to be party to it and they have to have binding enforceable uh, obligations. So what I hear you saying, it needs to be binding, but it can and should be differentiated so that the, the, the cut or the difference from the the difference from the uh, business as usual approach that the Indians may take may be different than the percentage we would take. You, you would accept that as a principle? Well, certainly every country is different in the type of natural resources it is endowed with, with the types of industries that its economy relies upon. So every country should have the sovereign right to decide how it's going to get uh, to the target and to the to the binding obligations that it has agreed to, because a country that has a lot of oil and gas and coal is going to go about it differently than a country that may be of a declining population that has a huge wind and solar base. And so we should not be trying to enter into this with a prescriptive formula. It should be flexible. There should be different sectoral approaches to this. But at the end of the day, if we allow countries to be exempt from any obligations, our industries, our jobs, will go overseas and our citizens will pay the price and it will do nothing to improve the environment. Thank you. Great. Right, gentlemen's time has expired. The gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, is recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your patience today and for the good conversation about this, because I think it is something that um, it, it does concern us all, and especially in this economic environment in which we find ourselves. And Mr. Bradley, I, um, um, I wanted to come to you. Um, one of the things that I hear from my ag community quite a bit, they are very concerned about livestock emissions and uh, regulations that might be forced on them. Um, I want to know what your opinion is on that. Um. Agricultural, uh, agricultural emissions are um, a significant source of emissions in, in, a, in large parts of the world. And certainly when we look at some of the developing countries that we've been talking about here today, um, finding reliable ways to um, address emissions from um, rice paddies, from cattle, for instance, in um, places like India, um, is going to be a, a large part of the of the overall solution that we need to we need to explore in those countries. Um, I would say that um, while there are a range of things that can be done um, within the agricultural um, community, this is probably something that is going to um, be somewhat more detailed than perhaps inclusion in cap and trade mechanisms of the kinds that we've been talking about here more generally. Um, certainly, I think there's, these are areas where um, there's some ripe scope for um, technology cooperation. Agricultural research is actually an area which has quite a good tradition um, of international collaboration. And certainly it would be, um, I think, a very, uh, a very promising area to try and find some constructive ways in which um, the US and developing countries can work together to, uh, to explore solutions to emissions in that sector. Well, I will, I will tell you that it is something that does concern us because you're talking about an issue that would end up affecting every single U.S. farm and the impact of that on our food security supply and network is um, something that is not lost on us. So uh, any further detail you have on that that you could submit in written form, I would definitely appreciate having. Another question for you. Um, Reading some of the economist uh, writings on climate change and dealing with the economic situation that we are currently in, the jobs retention issues that are in front of us, a large number of them have stated that spending billions of dollars on uh, climate change right now is unnecessary, and they say the money probably would be better spent going toward projects uh, such as clean water and sanitation, that that would be a more effective route in developing countries than putting the focus on climate change. And I'd like to hear you address that. Um, so just to make sure I understand your question, it would be more effective in, in that view to spend money on water systems in developing countries than on cutting emissions. Clean in water countries. and sanitation, correct, instead of addressing the emissions and climate change issue. Um, there are two ways in which this interacts with climate change. Um, one is, and this is something that you alluded to with the agricultural question as well, um, it's not going to be possible to build effective water and sanitation and similar infrastructure in developing countries um, unless, first of all, we take into account the climate impacts that they will already be facing, because those water systems will have to exist and, and provide their service within those stressed environments. And secondly, um, that simultaneously we do need to ensure that climate change doesn't um, race ahead and perhaps outstrip some of the value that those systems are going to bring. If you're asking, though, is it, does it make sense for a country like India to be spending more of its, of its effort proportionately on providing those kinds of services than on cutting emissions at this stage in its development, um, then yes, I would agree. I think one, this is an issue that we've, we've sort of harked back to a number of times in this, in this hearing, and it's important to understand how heterogeneous these countries are. There is a so-called Germany within India. You have 70, 80 million people in India who live what would be largely viewed as a Western lifestyle, have, have you know, drive Mercedes, have air conditioned apartments and so forth. Simply because they happen to be lodged in the middle of a very poor country should not exempt those kinds of communities for taking action. And this is why some of the discussions we've been having around developing countries emphasizes taking specific actions rather than necessarily starting from a national, um, a national emissions limit. Because 
within that national emissions limit, you potentially end up dragging down the, the uh, some dog millionaires who, um, who we desperately need to help get out of poverty, provide water to, provide energy to, and so on. Thank you. You're back. Great. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Deringer and Mr. Bradley. Uh, uh, Mr. Deringer, in, in your testimony, you suggest uh, that the U.S. move swiftly uh, to cap and reduce emissions, which I agree with, uh, incidentally. Uh, in fact, I had hoped that uh, it would have been something that we moved uh, uh, early uh, in this Congress. Uh, but with the hemorrhaging economy, um, my fear is that that will take such a precedent that uh, some of the issues that uh, some of us, at least on this side, are extremely concerned about are go going to be delayed. Um, we already, I think, have a somewhat of a damaged image in this area uh, internationally, and that's where Mr. Bradley comes in as well. Uh, does a delay in moving in this area uh, of capping uh, and, and, and then reducing emissions uh, further damage our international credibility as it relates to uh, climate change and, uh, and, and the effort by the, the, the world community to, to begin to address this serious problem. Um, and then secondly, if I can ask both questions and then I'll just let the two of you uh, speak. Um, uh, having a family in uh, Tanzania, uh, uh, Tanzania as, as they call the, the country, and we've changed it over here, but, uh, um, where they have a $1,500 a year uh, annual income uh, and I've seen the, the, the devastation there of the, of the environment. And they are really suffering there. Uh, uh, even in the shadows of Kilimanjaro, they have serious water uh, problems. Uh, the only way we're going to address developing countries is that the, th the uh, first world countries uh, understand that issue and then spend uh, whatever it is, is necessary. The de deforestation is, is just... I mean, uh, probably they've uh, knocked over an acre since this committer, committee has been uh, in session today. So I'd, I'd like to get you to, to uh, discuss, without rambling as I did, uh, the, uh, the two issues that I raised. Uh, let me try to address the first, and, and perhaps Rob will want to pick up on the second. Um, Absolutely, uh, further delay in domestic action by the United States uh, will delay and I think actually would preclude uh, the possibility of an effective global agreement uh, in action to date by the United States, uh, which is not only the largest economy in the world, but also the largest historic emitter of greenhouse gases, um, has been the single greatest impediment to progress uh, in developing an effective global agreement. Um, and I think that uh, we have been in a very prolonged period of stalemate and then pre-negotiation uh, with countries waiting to see what the U.S. is prepared to do. Uh, you know, we, we, we did see some progress over the past year. Uh, we saw some progress in uh, the major economies dialogue that President Bush initiated. There was uh, initially some great skepticism from other countries, um, but I think other countries came to recognize the value in that type of dialogue. But I think the reason it didn't produce any more is because President Bush didn't put anything on the table in terms of U.S. action. Uh, there are great expectations right now about uh, the new administration and what it will be prepared to do, both in terms of moving forward with domestic action uh, and bringing something into the negotiations. Uh, so I, I think that, uh, frankly, uh, domestic action in the U.S. Is, is essential. It may not be sufficient, uh, but it is the first essential step towards mo moving forward internationally. Uh, if I could, you, you mentioned uh, you know, concern about uh, the current economic 
economic situation, perhaps delaying action. Uh, I just want to note that uh, the Pew Center, along with the World Resources Institute, we're both members of the U.S. Climate Action Partnership, a coalition uh, of major companies and uh, non-government organizations uh, calling for uh, mandatory action and enactment of cap-and-trade legislation this year. And one of the points made by the CEOs of the companies is that there is a cost to regulatory uncertainty. Uh, for them, this is actually a very strong economic rationale to move as quickly as possible to enact the kind of legislation we need. Thank you. Mr. Brad. Um, as, as briefly as I can, um, uh, I've absolutely, without the United States taking, um, taking a, a leadership position on domestic policy, I see very little prospect for an international uh, agreement. Um, and it's striking, we, we focus a lot in these conversations on the sort of differences with, with China. But in many ways, the conversations that we hear when we go to China are extremely, con extremely similar to the ones being held here in Washington around climate change. They completely get how bad climate change is. They really worry about the impacts that they face. But they say, listen, we're trying to do some things right now, but without the, ma the world's biggest economy um, moving on this, how can, we, how can we move much faster than we are now? They have been extremely explicit. I, I, would, I would depart a little bit from, from Mrs. Mrs. Harbert's um, framing of it. The idea that um, China and India will, to a certain extent, wait on US leadership before, before following suit, I don't think is an article of faith. I think it's something that they have repeatedly and publicly stated, and that at the very least is worth um, trying to take them at their word on uh, for, for, for one part of that conversation. Um, certainly the, the issue of countries like Tanzania and um, the, the kinds of impacts that they face from climate change is one of the things that should galvanize us all. I was on Mount Kilimanjaro a couple of years ago and you see the pictures from the 50s and 60s with this kind of shaggy mane of snow on Mount Kilimanjaro and it's now thinner than my hair. Um, it's, uh, it's something which really underlines the, um, the incredible difficulties that many of these countries are going to face. One of the things that I think was very praiseworthy in many of the discussions around the climate bills last year was um, a fairly consistent intent on the part of Congress to provide, adaptation, uh, provide finance for international adaptation. Um, it was interesting to see the religious community in particular uh, fall full square behind that. And I think that is an important recognition of, of the moral case that there is there um, to provide that kind of uh, assistance to the countries that are going to be most affected. Great, gentlemen, so time has expired. Um, let, let's go back to this issue of uh, a Germany inside of uh, India, or what country would be inside of China given their economic development right now? Huh? Even even larger than huh? A couple of Germanys. Couple of Germanys inside of China, huh? So, Ms. Harbert, what do you think about the prospects of us reaching an agreement <clears throat> with the well-to-do in Shanghai, the well-to-do in Bangalore, the interests that they represent? at least in sectoral agreements on steel, on cement, where they're modernizing, where they're building these new plants. There's a good reason to believe. Do you not believe uh, that, um, uh, that we could, in fact, uh, reach differentiated um, agreements with, uh, with these countries so that wherever they're modernizing, wherever they're building, wherever their wealth is great, they're bound by the same rules, but we can take into account you know, the slum dog um, aspect of it in the movie that you haven't seen, but you can only assume that it is that dollar a, dollar a day, uh, you know, resident of both of those countries. Well, there are ongoing efforts right now that are succeeding on a sector by sector basis. The Asia Pacific Partnership, you have the aluminum, aluminum industry uh, working uh, amongst uh, 12 or 13 countries to find ways to produce aluminum in a much more energy efficient manner. The same in the area of cement and steel, et cetera. Uh, and that's because we are using technology and reality and economics as the base for making decisions on how to modernize these systems. One of the most important things we could do is reduce the, the tariff barriers on clean energy goods and services. And we have not been successful in the Doha round. We may need to look at different ways of doing this. Why are we making uh, clean energy more expensive in the developing world? That is, that is needless. And, and we could reduce that. And those would be American jobs and American exports. But if you listen to the Chinese, and I spent a lot of time in China, as have you, 
And the Chinese have said, yes, we're willing to sit at the table. It's going to be very costly. Our priority is economic growth, bringing our people out of poverty so that we don't have these pockets of Germany, that everybody has a much better baseline and we should afford them the right to have their people have a better way of life. But they said it's going to cost money and we don't have it and therefore we expect to be paid. In fact, they have said they want 0.7% of the industrialized world's GDP on an annual basis to be able to sit at the climate negotiating table and agree to something. Well, that would mean $80 billion every year from the American taxpayer to fund China's compliance with an international agreement. That's a heck of a lot of money. Uh, and that's just the U.S. obligation. So we have to be very careful in how we approach bringing them in and that it ultimately doesn't fall just purely on an economic basis on the people inside the United States that for a long time have been uh, more prosperous. So, Darren, do you agree with Ms. Hubbard? Is that a good formula for us to use? Well, well first, on, on the question of sectoral agreements, we think that's certainly something worth exploring. I don't know about the practicality of trying to negotiate something with a national government uh, with respect to action in specific geographic areas, but in terms of action within certain economic sectors, uh, that's certainly something we should be discussing. And in fact, if we were able to reach uh, agreements around specific sectors, particularly the energy intensive sectors, that would be one very effective way to address the competitiveness concerns that, uh, that, that we have. Um, uh, I mean, as, as far as uh, the formula, uh, the, the, the quid pro quo, if you will, uh, that, that needs to be reached in order to move forward internationally, um, I think we need to be very clear. We need to see commitments. We need to see reasonable commitments. We also need to be prepared to provide some support to those countries that need it to achieve those commitments. In the case of China, uh, when you have conversations, I, I, I mean, the impression I get is that uh, they understand uh, that, A, they have lots of money and that's not really the thing they need from, from us, uh, and that lots of money is probably not forthcoming uh, from the United States toward China. But what they do need uh, is some assistance on the technology front. Uh, All right, so what do you recommend? You know, Ms. Hobart said the same thing. So how do we handle this issue I, I of think technology the, and its transfer? What would you have built into the agreement? First you, Mr. Derringer, then we'll go back to you, Ms. Harbert. What are the specifics that you would like to see included? Well, I think an immediate priority for this administration is to initiate uh, a high-level dialogue with China uh, to have an honest conversation about what they're prepared to do and what they need to do that. Um, I think in terms of the types of measures that we build into an agreement, uh, we need specific commitments from them, um, and we need to help establish financial mechanisms that provide support, although that will be differentiated support, and you need to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis based on the types of actions countries are prepared to do, the types of assistance that would be available to them, uh, given their national circumstances. And for a country like China uh, that has uh, considerable financial resources available to it, um, then that may not be the most appropriate form of support. So you're not that sympathetic to China in terms of our need to provide them with technology transfer in order to deal with their issues. You think that they have sufficient technological capacity and resources to do it themselves? Well, I think they have sufficient financial capacity, mm -hmm. but I do think that there may be areas uh, where we can assist them in terms of technological capacity provided. I mean, well, one, we need to so have an honest you, conversation. But, but there, just so, you, uh, just so you that know, I can understand what you're saying. So what they do you recommend specifically that we do in those areas that you think? Coming uh, to, to clear terms about the sharing of technology uh, in a way that allows them access to the state-of-the-art clean technologies that will enable them to reduce their emissions while at the same time uh, protecting and preserving and, and again, the intellectual, what are those, the intellectual what are those, property of, of U.S. companies. And, and, but what are those clear agreements? Uh, 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 how do we make it? There, there, there are many companies that operate uh, you know, day to day right now in China, U.S. companies uh, that have technology sharing agreements and are able to do business in China in ways that they don't feel is undermining their intellectual property. So I think we those are the types of agreements that we need to work out with respect to the clean energy technologies. Ms. Hobart. I think there's three things. First of all, the United States has already put on the table the International Clean Energy Fund. They were joined by the UK and Japan for a facility housed at the World Bank that would provide concessionary financing to the developing world for clean energy projects. That would do a lot for us in this economy and generate jobs here at home, and it would do a lot to uh, have commercially viable projects built on the back of the private private sector rather than on governments around the world that would distribute clean energy. We should fund that effort. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, we should 
be serious about reducing tariffs on clean energy goods and services around the world that reduces the cost of clean energy. And if the priority is economic growth in Bangalore and in Shanghai, that will reduce the cost uh, of providing that. And we have to recognize that the technologies are not owned by governments. The United States government can't just go over to the Chinese government and give it away. They don't own it. GE does, Dow does, DuPont does, and they're not going to give it away. That's not the way that our system works. And so we need to have very strong intellectual property protections in place so that we can cooperate with China, but we're not going. We should disabuse ourselves and we should stop using the words tech transfer in the negotiations. The Chinese and the Indians and others are expecting to receive a big bundle of technology one day, and it's not forthcoming that way. It just doesn't work. And so we have to find a way to make it work and for that technology commerce to be technology transfer. Uh, Mr. Bradley, um Let's go to Mexico for a second. They're talking about a cap-and-trade system that would come as kind of a shock to most people that Mexico has decided to take a leadership role. How realistic is it for us to expect that Mexico would adopt a meaningful cap-and-trade system that could be looked to with some confidence as something which is binding and forcible and confidence-building? Um. <clears throat> Thank you. I'll certainly address that question. I wonder if I could ask your indulgence just to make one uh, comment on the China and technology um, okay, please uh, do so. question. Um, um, the Chinese government strong-armed Huanang Power, which is China's largest power utility, into setting aside capital to put into the FutureGen project. In other words, the Chinese were proposing to pay money towards the construction of a, of a power project in Illinois. Um, they, the project was cancelled by the administration and the Chinese found out about it in the Washington Post. Um, they have repeatedly emphasized in many contexts, and, and it's true that in the negotiations they do have some very, I would say, unrealistic sort of starting negotiating positions about financial transfers, but in many cases they're seeking to jointly and equally co-fund research and development and to share the intellectual property that arises from it. And that's a good model, Ms. Harbert, huh? To share the intellectual property? Jointly fund and... Um uh, develop the to the extent that the intellectual property that is generated, there can be common and differentiated benefits, sure. Yeah. Um, on the question of Mexico, um, I don't want to imply that Mexico is, is sort of on the brink of passing a cap-and-trade bill. Um, my colleagues have been working in Mexico now for seven or eight years, helping build up uh, the databases and inventories necessary for some key sectors to uh, monitor and verify their emissions effectively. Um, the climate change strategy that um, the Mexican government um, came up with last year has talked about setting targets for um, specific sectors. It would probably not be economy-wide in the first instance. Mind you, neither is the EU's emissions trading system economy-wide. The kinds of sectors that we're talking about are similar to those in the EU sector, heavy, heavy manufacturing and the power sector. Um, the, the dynamic by which that will be put in place may be a little bit different um, than in the United States. So, for instance, um, in many instances, though, the, the companies involved are actually state-owned, um, most particularly, for instance, uh, the refining sector and some of the power generation. So, it's, um, I would say that um, Mexico is not on the brink of a cap-and-trade bill, um, as, as we would recognize it here, but I would say that there is a very realistic prospect that significant sectors will have a, a cap-and-trade type policy applied to them in the kind of time scale in which we'll be bringing, to get, bringing in the next climate agreement. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, there's a national teach-in today um, on global warming that's taking place in hundreds of campuses uh, on college and in and, and high school alike all across the country. In my district, Brandeis University has asked me to participate, uh, but Rather than me teaching them, I thought it would be important to let Congress hear from the students. So today at this hearing, uh, I'm going to put uh, Brandeis uh, University in the chairman's seat and ask a question sent to me uh, by Matthew Schmidt, who is a sophomore and who heads the Students for Environmental Action uh, at uh, Brandeis. Here's the question. After World War II, the United States played a crucial role in the rebuilding of Europe. Has the time come for the United States to consider a similar role in spreading clean energy technologies throughout the world. Mr. Derringer. 
I would say absolutely, but the United States will not be in a position to do that on its own, obviously. It will need to, to work in partnership with other, other developed countries and potentially with other developing countries who increasingly have the financial and technological wherewithal to assist in the diffusion of technology worldwide. Uh, I think it's also interesting to, to reference uh, uh, the, the institutions that emerged in the post-World War II environment. Uh, we are now approaching a point uh, where it's time to reconsider uh, the mission of those institutions. Um, and I, I think that in moving forward on technology to address climate change, it's worth considering reinvention of the Bretton Woods institutions um, and making this one of their missions going forward so that we can move beyond the traditional donor recipient model, as Ms. Harbert put it, um, to a, a new model uh, in which countries work in partnership to advance the types of technologies we need. Mr. Bradley. Um, I think a, um, a sort of a reservation on that model is um, that, um, as, as Ms. Harbert has been saying, it's not as though the U.S. sort of owns all of these technologies and it's a question of transferring them overseas. And I do think that some of our international partners um, don't completely understand that. And certainly, um, I think some commentators that, and certainly some climate negotiators imagine that we have a lot of great technologies in a basement somewhere that we're, we're deliberately not sharing. This is more of a collaborative effort. Um, but I do um, think that the model that is going to work and the model that ultimately will invalidate some of the sort of longer projections that we see in models, the thing that isn't captured in models is that we, will, we must get to a point where some of the technologies that are going to let us have zero carbon energy really break through to the point of competitiveness. The one thing that can do more than anything else in the world to drive that is by setting a, a carbon regime in the United States which will allow the world's biggest, most technologically advanced and most innovative economy to start really pushing those, those technologies forward. That will be America's biggest gift to the world. Um, the technologies that ultimately will drive that revolution will come from all kinds of places, but they will come from America more than from any other single place. Um, so does America play a role in, in a way that looks exactly like the Marshall Fund? Not quite, but does America play that in incredibly important core role in driving an energy technology revolution? I certainly hope so. Ms. Harbert. I guess I would make three uh, comments to the wonderful question posed by the student. Uh, First, you know, we are investing less in clean energy R&D in this country than we did uh, since the 1970s. So we have not put our money where our mouth is. And we need to be serious about not just the R&D, but uh, as you said, in the deployment and providing the incentives uh, out there to actually have these technologies penetrate the marketplace, which will generate exports and generate an innovation revolution uh, of clean energy. To do that, we need uh, sufficient loan guarantees in this country. We need a clean energy energy bank, we need production tax credits that will send to value. There's a lot of financial instrumentation that is very valuable that could be put in place uh, absent having an overarching mandate. Secondly, he brought up World War II. Our infrastructure in this country was built right after World War II, and we really haven't done anything to modernize it since. And if we're going to have a growing economy and fuel and economic recovery, we've got to get serious about infrastructure in this country. Otherwise, we're going to have brownouts uh, that certainly would not do anything for our economic recovery. And we can demonstrate huge leaps of technology in our electricity grid since it has not really been modernized since World War II. And that will certainly help with the 1.6 billion people that don't have electricity around the world to have it in the advanced technology state. Last but not least, and maybe the most important, is this question came from a student at a university, and we are not graduating enough scientists, enough engineers, enough math, science, uh, math students to actually have the intellectual feedstock we need for the innovation trans innovative transformation that we need. We need more engineers, we need more scientists, we need more academic institutions uh, that have teachers that are capable of doing that. It starts in pre-kindergarten all the way through PhD. So we've got to get serious about the intellectual foundation of what we're talking about here because we don't have the people that we need about all these goals that we're talking about. So we talk about importing oil all the time. We're going to be talking about importing all of our intellectual feedstock to fuel this revolution, and that really won't sit well here at home. Thank you, Ms. Harbert, very much. Um, and we thank the Brandeis student for uh, his question. Um, you know, President Kennedy in his... Uh, in his inaugural, um, obviously uttered that famous statement, asked not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. But he also 
then followed it by talking to the world and saying to the citizens of the world, ask not what the United States can do for you, but what we can do together at working for uh, the goal of freedom and progress in the world at large. And I think here we have many countries that will be able to contribute. Germany is the leader in photovoltaic uh, 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 solar um, uh, technology and and uh, uh, Denmark, the leader in wind. And obviously, there are many parts of the world that can play uh, leadership roles with the United States, of course, as the largest industrialized country, uh, hopefully playing the largest role uh, of them all. Uh, in the stimulus package that is now under consideration between the House uh, and Senate, uh, there is a large, large infusion of funding for education. Uh, we agree with that insight that you made, Ms. Hobart, that uh, we have fallen behind. We have to make the investment in education because without that, uh, in the long run, we cannot be uh, leaders. To a very large extent, our leadership now is based upon the huge investment which we made a generation ago. That's why we win the Nobel Prizes now. That's why uh, we are the leaders. But we can't know 30 years from now whether or not we are going to be the winners over India and China and Germany and other countries until we first determine how much we want to invest once again uh, in our technologies, in our young people, uh, to make sure that they are competitive. That is still an unknown result uh, because we have yet to make those decisions. Uh, however, a renewable electricity standard would give an incentive for the development of new technologies. Uh, the tax breaks, the, the, uh, the incentive for uh, the development of a new uh, modern technology-driven, telecommunications-driven driven grid uh, is also a part of the solution, and we have to get to the to the business of uh, developing those new technologies. Uh, and then the United States will be the leader, but amongst other countries as well, in solving this problem. Uh, does the gentleman from um, Missouri have any other comments? Uh, this has been a fabulous uh, um, uh, introduction to where we now stand in the world on these issues. Uh, it's going to be a very, very fast paced race for 305 days to Copenhagen. Uh, and uh, we intend uh, to ensure that uh, this Congress and the American people are informed uh, of, all of the all of the choices which we have to make this year uh, if the United States is to be the leader when that meeting is convened. Thank you all so much for your. Thank you. I see you.